Hello, welcome to 30 Minutes, I'm Rick Anthony. The subtitle of today's program could be, Whatever Happened to Mark Howard? Uh, the news anchor on channels six and three, who for about 30 years brought to Delaware Valley viewers uh, the evening news, good and bad, happy and sad, plus weekend talk shows. My guest today is Mark Howard, here in person, to bring us up to date on what he's been doing since retiring in 2007. And along the way, we'll probably talk about uh, broadcast journalism then and now. Mark, welcome to 30 Minutes. Rick, thank you. I do appreciate your being here. Um, I really was looking forward to visiting with you because you have such a rich history. You've got stories to tell, I'm sure, and I hope you'll share those with us. But as we always do, we begin with who you are, where you came from, and so on. I, I don't think you're a native Philadelphian. But you, Pennsylvanian, uh, but not Philadelphia. Uh -huh. Bring us uh, up to date on what that means. Born and raised in Sharon, Pennsylvania, which is right on the Ohio border. In mm. fact, if you took Interstate 80 West, uh -huh. it's the last exit in Pennsylvania. Uh, went to Sharon High School, graduated in 1954. How far out of Pittsburgh then? Uh, now about an hour and a quarter. Oh. In those days, two hours. Uh -huh. Yeah. Northwest of Pittsburgh, uh -huh. right near Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, so is it a steel town? It was a uh, steel, next town over, Farrell, had Sharon Steel. Okay. Uh, right. Sharon Steel is in Farrell, okay. next door. Right. And, and it was a big Westinghouse plant there. Mm -hmm. So it was in the old, it's the Rust Belt. Yeah. The downtown is pretty empty. Good people, though. I, I still have a cousin there. Yeah. Uh, but a, a diminishing family. Yeah. yeah time passes. Um, but I, I graduated high school in 1954. Mm -hmm. But while in high school in December of 53, uh, I was doing an education week program with the speech class, and we put our little program on the local radio station, mm -hmm. WPIC. And uh, a week or so later, I got a phone call that uh, the manager, the, the owner had heard me on the radio yeah. and said, young man has a nice voice, why don't we hire him to work in the morning before school? It was a daytime station. Mm -hmm. So in the winter, they went on the air at 5 a. M., 6 a.m. and signed off at 5. Mm -hmm. So they had a part-time opening from 6 to 8 a.m. to uh, yeah. read, read some news, right. uh, play a few records, etc. Introduce a, a, a minister for the morning uh, prayer, religious yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I started doing that in December of 53 while 16 years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 54 years later to the day, <laughs> I retired from KYW-TV uh -huh. in uh, November of 07. When did you make up your mind that that was the career you wanted to pursue? Well, it's interesting. I never went after it. Yeah. In other words, I was taking this uh, speech class simply because I was taking a class. I had some electives to fill out mm -hmm. in my high school schedule. Mm -hmm. So I took a speech course. Um, and then I was offered this job, so I took the job. Now, when high school ended... They offered me a full-time job, and I mm -hmm. thought, well, I could stay on working, so I did, and I went to college part-time. Mm -hmm. So I went to Youngstown State University. Mm -hmm. It's now Youngstown State. Then it was Youngstown College, and I went to that there from 54 to 64. In fact, I think I graduated the year that Ron Jaworski started there. Is that right? Yeah, he quarterbacked <laughs> for the Youngstown team. Uh -huh. So... Uh, I spent 10 years working. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Degree in, in journalism or No, actually, I, I majored in philosophy and mathematics because in, I, I didn't need to study journalism. I was yeah, doing it. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting. I never really pursued it. I never really thought of it as a career. Mm -hmm. uh, I just thought it was a, a no. nice, interesting thing to do. And I had a, uh, an enlightening moment, which you get every now and then. Originally, when I was in high school, I was a bit of a geek, and I wanted to study math and maybe teach college. Mm -hmm. That was kind of my goal. So when I graduated finally at age 27, I thought, well, it's time to get serious. I either should go to law school or I should go to graduate school mm -hmm. and consider doing something real, a grown-up job. Yes, uh, a paying job. So one day, my senior year, I'm walking out of the math, the math class, and the head of the department says, this is 1964, he says, uh, somebody told me you work on TV. I said, I do. He said, is that a good job? I said, it's easy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know mm -hmm. what I'm doing and I do it. Not difficult. He said, does it pay well? 1964, I said, well, I make $10,000 a year. And he said, that's 2,000 more than I make. Uh -huh. And I walked out of the room depressed 
because yes. I'm old enough yes. that you go to work to make a living. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's mm -hmm. old school. And I'm old enough to be in that, from that generation. And I thought, if I can do something like this, which is enjoyable, interesting, not difficult, didn't happen to be for mm -hmm. me, and make more money than the head of a math department, who has to have a PhD? That yes. takes seven years. Yeah. Oh. So I just kind of glided along. At that time, I was working in Youngstown, Ohio, uh, near Sharon, doing radio and TV, mm -hmm. and doing news. So mm -hmm. I had already moved on into a little more serious mm -hmm. realm of the business. And uh, as luck would have it, in 1967, three years later, I walked into an agent's office in New York City, handed her a tape, and got a job in New York at Channel 5, which was starting a news program in 67. Uh, well, The 10 o'clock news. It was one of the yeah. first 10 o'clock newses in the country, uh -huh. an independent station. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, <clears throat> I worked there for, uh, in New York for uh, seven years. There, I went from Channel 5 to Channel 11, and then went on a few years in Hartford, Connecticut, and then came to Philly. Mm -hmm. Which of those markets did you enjoy the most? I like New England, and Hartford really was a very pleasant place mm -hmm. to live and work. Mm -hmm. New York City is obviously the capital yes. of the yeah. world, and there's yeah. much to be said for that. Um, I, think, I think if you make a good <coughs> living, New York is probably the best place mm -hmm. on earth to live. Mm -hmm. But you need to make a good living mm -hmm. because it's quite expensive. And do you have a preference between radio and television, even though you've spent most of your career in television? I really like radio. Oh, I had an interesting brief experience. When I worked in Hartford, six <coughs> months before I came to Philly, uh, I left the TV station there and mm -hmm. went to a radio station and did a talk show from 8 o'clock to midnight, mm -hmm. five nights a week or whatever. That was the most fun I've ever had in broadcasting because... Talk radio does something that no other medium can do. Now, this is going back 30 years, 40 years, when you didn't have producers in your ear telling you everything yes. you needed to know. You had to know. So you'd read the papers in the morning, and then the phone would ring, mm -hmm. and somebody would say, so what do you think of the Minnesota primary? Mm -hmm. And you would then have to talk about it because you couldn't say, I don't know. Yep. You'd look stupid. So if a talk show succeeded, it was all your credit. Mm -hmm. If a TV show succeeds, well, it's your credit, it's pictures, uh -huh. it's yes. camera crews, it's sure. production. In other words, it's not just the talent. Yeah. Radio is you. So if your radio show succeeds, it's because you people like credit. to listen yeah. to Rick Anthony. Yeah. Uh, so you came to Philadelphia in 1977. Yes. Mm -hmm. To Channel 6. Yes. And you were there for how many years? 25 years. Then moved to Channel 3. 3. Before retiring in 2007. Seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got a series of questions. I mean, you, you've met so many interesting people. You were the first to break, I'm sure, some big stories along the way, uh, or among the first to break some big stories. Uh, so th the questions that come to mind are, what was the most memorable moment, if there was one, in your long and distinguished career, uh, among the most embarrassing moments or situations you found yourself in, on the air, in front of the entire public? Let's start with the most memorable moment. Maybe it was a, an individual. Well, it's interesting. Uh, if I were to think back on the, the most stunning moment to me was probably <clears throat> I worked at Channel 11, which was an independent station in 1974. No network. Mm -hmm. So the White House announced that President Nixon was going to have a 9 o'clock news conference. And, of course, the scuttlebutt was he was going to resign. Yeah. But it was not official. And Channel 11 decided we should carry that even mm -hmm. though we weren't a network. So at 9 o'clock that night, I went on the air and introduced the President of the United States, who we live feed mm -hmm. from the White House. And, uh, and then, of course, when he finished, I had to try to make some sense out yes. of what had just happened. And even though you knew he was going to resign, that had never happened before. Yeah. That was an earth-shaking moment. Yeah. And so I would have to say that as getting mm -hmm. goosebumps while working, mm -hmm. that was probably the highlight. Mm -hmm. In that sense. And the most embarrassing moment, if there was one? I'll tell you the truth. I don't, I don't ever really remember being, oh, my goodness, embarrassed on the air. Now, I must have been, but I'm probably not that smart that I, sh <laughs> that I didn't know that I should have been. <laughs> so, so, never a misstatement, never a miscue, never I forgot you by lines, uh, uh, having to improvise. I've had a cell phone go off in my pocket <clears throat> when I was, you know. And, 
and I would have answered it. But, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I guess the reason I never was embarrassed is that I've never taken television terribly seriously. Huh. In other words, yes, we're giving you information, and I would be mortified, worse than mm -hmm. embarrassed, if I gave wrong information, <clears throat> mm -hmm. especially if I shouldn't have done mm -hmm. it, if I knew better. Mm -hmm. That never happened. Um, but aside from that, it's not the New York Times. I'd be much more embarrassed if I wrote a New York Times article and it had an yeah. error in it yeah. than I would be if I made an error on television. Uh, let me see if I understand what you say. I think I understand what you say. Are you say the New York Times has a certain gravitas about sure. it, and there, and you don't feel that you or what you represent, broadcast journalism, has the same gravitas, or is it that you are delivering in your role? You're simply delivering the news. You're not commenting on. You're not interpreting. I believe that's the case. True. Yeah. Well, certainly was in my day. Yeah. yeah, certainly. yeah. Um, I guess. <clears throat> I guess if. If you only read the New York Times, <clears throat> you would have a record of Western civilization pretty mm -hmm. much for the day. Mm -hmm. You could probably say the same for the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. Those two papers, and probably only those two, would give you a complete worldwide view of what's going on. Mm -hmm. If you only watched the 6 o'clock news on Channel 6 or 3 or 10, you would not have the whole day. Mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, it's not the same kind yes. of a tableau. Yes. So I always assume that television news does two things that print doesn't do. It brings you a sense of what happened, a feeling of it, because you see the pictures of the actual event, like Occupy Wall Street. Mm -hmm. You see the people in the street. <clears throat> uh, and the other thing it does, it gives you an overview. Yes. But it's not the record of the day's events. Therefore, if I thought, for example, that you're only going to watch me for one hour, like I ended up doing the 4 o'clock news on Channel 3, yeah. and that's the only news you were going to see, I would have been very unhappy because we did not have all of the day's news in that hour. But, but Mark, as, as print, uh, began to lose its prominence, the, the demise of daily newspapers and so on. Most people, I shouldn't say most, many, many people were relying for all of their news, for the 10 o'clock, the early evening news, or the 11 o'clock news. Uh, I th certainly today, I think most people rely on television and the internet for their news, certainly not the newspaper. That's probably true. Yeah. Most people will cite television as their primary sure. source. Yeah. I think that's scary. Because I, was all they're say, getting, I don't want to they're say getting, any, They're getting headlines. Too. I don't want to say anything, anything bad about people who only watch <laughs> television news because I made a living doing that, and I yeah. thank you all very much for 40, for yes. 54 years of... Of, of good work, um, but I really think a person needs more if they want to be informed. Now, well, I don't disagree with. Now, by the way, you could go through life and say, you know, I, I really don't care to be totally informed about things that are not at my doorstep. Yeah. In other words, I'm not interested in the results. As we record this program, I think uh, Wisconsin is deciding whether or not yes. to keep a governor. Many people could say. I really don't care what the people of Wisconsin mm -hmm. do. It's, you know, it's mm -hmm. interesting, and mm -hmm. maybe tomorrow I'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Now, I for, would watch it and see the results. Yes. Coming. I care about it. I can't wait to see the results but tonight. A, a fair example would be this. Uh, some people live and die on the Philadelphia Eagles. Yes, or the Phillies or the Sixers. Yep. Sports fans, bless them. Yep. Now, I'm not a big sports fan. I pay attention, mm -hmm. but I'm not a big sports fan, mm -hmm. so I don't immediately go to the sports page. Right. In fact, if I'm in a hurry, when I was coming to record this program with you today, I get four newspapers delivered every mm -hmm. morning, the Daily News, the Inquirer, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times, mm -hmm. and I go through all of them. So I had to get up a half hour earlier to go yeah. through the papers today, and I didn't read as much of it, of them, as I, yes. I would ordinarily because I was in a hurry, but I could skip the sports pages and mm -hmm. just look at a headline or two mm -hmm. and see, oh, the Phillies lost, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to see that. Um, but that's how politics is. Now, I would argue with you that politics is more important than sports mm -hmm. because what happens in a Wisconsin election, what happens in a presidential yes. election, eventually it could end up mm -hmm. deciding how much tax we pay sure. 
or how much service we get from our government. Mm -hmm. So I could argue that it's more important. But then you could also say, my one vote doesn't matter anyway because no presidential election or big elections ever been won by one vote. So my one vote mm -hmm. isn't that critical, so I really don't have to. But, but as a citizen, as someone who was uh, an important conduit for information in, during your career, uh, d does it bother you, uh, the, ec the level of economic literacy or lack of economic literacy in this country, the lack of interest or concern about what's happening in politics and all of the other things that affect our lives and our children's and our grandchildren's lives? There seems to be a disconnect among a significant percentage of the population. And I, part of it is generational, I think. Um, I, I care more because I, I grew up, at it, as you did, at a different time. Uh, this, the millennials, the, the, the Generation Y, I'm not sure they're as tuned in to what's going on, except some of the social causes that seem to motivate them and drive them. To me, the most interesting fact it, it amazes me that, that Jay Leno, when I watch just the first 15 minutes or so, and he, and he goes out on the street and asks people, <laughs> well, they don't what's know. the capital of the right? Who's the vice president? They I have saw it, no yeah. idea. And I don't think they're faking it. They yeah. really don't know. College graduates, for him. Here's, here's the most interesting it's fact. frightening. Here's the most interesting fact that I have pondered all my life, and I still don't understand. I understand mm -hmm. it, but I, I can't unravel it. The people who vote the least are young people. The people who vote the most are old people. Yes. Yet, the people who should vote the most are young people because yes. our government today is laying out mm -hmm. programs and plans that will impact the, whole, the next 50, 60 years exactly. for these young people who are coming out of college. Yes. And they don't seem to care. Now, you and I, we get our little check from, from uh, Uncle. Social Security. Uh -huh. uh, and we're going to get that anyway. I mean, mm -hmm. I get things from ARP, and ARP says, oh, my God, the sky is going to yes, fall. Yes. But the sky is not going to fall because old people vote and politicians aren't going to take away our Social Security check. But So we don't have to worry, yet we all vote. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting, and I think it is partly generational. Sure. There's a sense of obligation. And well, look, when it, you're 22 it, years it, old. It comes with being a good citizen. When you're 22 years old, you got hormones at work. Yeah, you're absolutely you can't, right. Yeah. You can't. I guess overcome. we were all the same way sure. at that age. Absolutely. Uh, but it does concern me, to, to one of your earlier points. I didn't realize until quite recently that uh, under current law, or at least, uh, yeah, current law, Obamacare, that my premium and your premium for Medicare is going to go from $96 to $100 and some dollars and by 2014 to 240 some dollars per person per month. Part B. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think most people know that. Yeah. And if they did, they should care. And unless you make a lot of money, most people don't know that if you make over 100000 mm -hmm. a year or something, you already pay more for yes, Part B. Yes, right. I think, I think it goes up to a maximum of 350 a month already. It, most people are right. not aware of no. it, and they should be. Well, I can only say because, this. Because of the diffidence on the part of the public, right. they get away with it in Harrisburg and in Washington and all of the other places where these rules are made. Every now and then the public will rear its head. Every now and then. Uh, yeah. Like when they, when they had a midnight pay raise in Harrisburg. Yeah, right. And then they threw out a whole bunch yeah. of legislators. Yeah. But it's hard to get people to focus on things. It, it is, uh, which is part of another one of the issues, the 24-7 the, the news cycle. Oh. Uh, it's not news, it's noise. And it's not even noise, it's, it's uh, an attempt at some really bad entertainment yeah. in too many instances, just trying to fill... Well, it's interesting you say that because I saw, heard recently an intelligent political person say, uh, that President Obama made a mistake talking about Bain Capital, mm -hmm. where Romney worked, yes. um, so early, because mm -hmm. it'll be gone yes. by the fall. Yes. They say he should have brought that up in mid-October, mm -hmm. because it does have some ring to it. Yes. After all, the man made hundreds of millions of dollars, and you yes. know you could argue sure. all day, well, how, well, you know, right or wrong. Mm -hmm. But the point is, it's an interesting argument, yes. and they should have saved it. And they didn't save it. They, right. It's gone. You can't uh, bring it back. Uh, interesting argument. Yeah, it was an interesting headline. And again, that's all we're dealing with these days are headlines. Try to there's get too, attention. There's too little time to read the story, to begin to understand, to comprehend, and to understand the implications of what's happening. 
uh, if in fact there's any uh, motivation to do so. Uh, get back to your career. I, I ask you about your most uh, memorable, most embarrassing. You had the good fortune of interviewing, being in the company of an awful lot of really interesting, many of them prominent people. Here in the Philadelphia, who was the most interesting person who made news regularly or was in the news regularly? You had that Sunday show, I think it was, where you had... Inside Story. Yeah, yeah. Inside mm -hmm. Story. Uh, you had uh, people sitting around the table who were newsmakers. That was Issues and Answers we right. did, but we yeah. had guests, yes. Yeah. I think who, without who a doubt, comes to mind? if you look at Philadelphia for the last 40 years, you'd have to say that Frank Rizzo I, was the most... I would have expected that. ...noticeable yes. personality. Yes. Now, you couldn't ignore him. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Frank Rizzo was no taller than I am. But yet I'd walk in a room and say, Mr. Mayor, how are you? And he'd lean back and look down at me. Uh -huh. <laughs> he, he had a fascinating way of making you feel like he was taller, yeah. even though he was. Uh -huh. But he was an imposing character. And here's a fact that nobody in Philadelphia believes. Um, Digby Baltzell is a, was a Penn professor of sociology. He's most famous for, in one book called The Protestant Establishment, he had a footnote used the acronym WASP, White Anglo-Saxon yes. Protestant. And that's the first time it ever appeared in Is print. Is that right? I didn't so know that. They credit him with having uh -huh. popularized the, the term WASP. <clears throat> Anyhow, E. Digby Baltzell. His first name was Ed, Edward, but he went by Digby. He wrote a book called, it was about the Protestant establishment in Boston and the Quaker establishment mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. Yeah. I think it was called Protestant Boston. Uh, Whatever. But that, it compared the two cities. Mm -hmm. And he made the interesting point that Boston did well politically because the clergy got involved in politics. Cotton Mather was a famous mm -hmm. preacher who was a political leader, anti-slavery mm -hmm. leader in, in Massachusetts uh, in the early days of the, uh, of the nation. Uh, Philadelphia, he said, the first nationally known person born and raised in Philadelphia was Frank Rizzo. There was no hmm. really famous. Now, you could say Hugh Scott, who was a, a prominent Republican yes. senator. Yes. But na nationally, 50% of the mm -hmm. people didn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. it, in other words, the first truly, oh, yeah, I know that guy. I hadn't was thought Frank about that. Now, a lot of people say, oh, Ben Franklin. No, he was born and raised in Boston, uh -huh. came to Philadelphia. Uh -huh. And of course, was very well known. Huh. But isn't that a that's interesting? Isn't that that's a stunning, almost yeah. frightening? It is. <laughs> frightening. <laughs> if you had to pick one, I, I knew Frank Rizzo <laughs> quite well. Uh, we did were you, very, did we, you like him? I liked him personally mm -hmm. a lot. Didn't like his politics. I didn't dislike his politics. I disliked what I think was his uh, use of politics to play people against each other, mm -hmm. to subtly uh, line people up yes. and take sides. Yeah. He never said a bad word. He never said a racist thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but but he, he came to symbolize a, the last vestiges of white America hanging on, yeah. you know, while these people are coming in and taking over right. our cities. And I don't... I can't honestly tell you that he meant to do that, but he he knew it worked, and politically he what, took what advantage. Of what it. accounted for his eventual fall from grace, and it, uh, he lost that charisma. Oh, he lost the power. I, I summed that it he up had. in a news story I did. I was working at Channel Six when he ran against Wilson Good to try to come back as mayor again. You know, you can only yes. run for two terms right. back to back, but then you can go out and come yes. back for two more. Right. So he tried to come back against <clears throat> Wilson Good, I want to say in 1983, mm -hmm. I believe. So he ran in the Democratic primary against Good. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he was going to run again against him again. He ran as a Republican. Anyway, when he ran against Wilson Good the first time as a Democrat, 1983, and I was doing a story on a big kickoff up in the Northeast. Mm -hmm in a big hall, one of those places where people yeah. have weddings and things. I'm going to guess there were at least a thousand people in there. It was mobbed. And they cheered him. They loved him. And I got a brainstorm. I walked around and put a mic in somebody's face. 
What's your name? Rick Anthony. Where are you from? Glassboro, New Jersey. Where are you from? Uh -huh. Bucks County, uh -huh. Neshaminy. And I ended the piece by saying, there's no question, if there were an election and all these people could vote, mm -hmm. Frank Rizzo would be the next mayor of Philadelphia again. You're right. Unfortunately, <laughs> thousands of his people, and most of them in this room, have left town. Uh -huh. That's what happened to him. He would, uh -huh. he would have been reelected. He would have stayed, come back, I think, and beaten Wilson Good. But if you look at the demographics, the city in 1950 yes, was uh, sure. two million people, yeah. and it was, uh, you know, 90% mm -hmm. white. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. then the city, the core of the city, mm -hmm. well, what was the goal of the South Philly kid? Yeah. To move out? Yeah. Move to Jersey? Move to Cherry Hill? Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. There so was that migration. That's it. But however, it's like all things, just that pendulum started to swing back. Now, uh, yes. So many South Philadelphians, once they left, missed it. They wanted to come back. Maybe as they got older and the kids were grown and, and so on. Center City is a nice life. I, yeah, I guess. Yeah. My wife and I had, for the longest time, that was our goal, uh, mm -hmm. once the kids left and so on. But the more I thought about it, uh, I, I, well, you lived downtown for oh, yes. a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure Don't you did. Don't know, but did, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, one person with whom you worked, and I, I would mention this to you before, is Jim O'Brien. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, everybody loved him. What, what wasn't to love? He was a bad boy, and uh, he made the the weather somehow. I guess he was. Was he the first who really made weather interesting and entertaining? Well, he was an early practitioner yeah. of turning the weather into fun. Yeah, yeah. But there were others who did it too. There, there was As a fellow well, in Cleveland, Ohio, named Joe Finan. Uh, okay, but not in. You'd this only know his name because he was. Remember the payola scandal with yeah, records? Yeah, sure, yeah. Joe got caught up in that uh -huh. back in 1959, uh -huh. 60. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I was working in Cleveland at the time. Uh -huh. I knew him. But he was one, an early practitioner of uh -huh. the funny weather show. Yeah. Uh, let's fast forward because I'd love to spend more time talking to you about uh, your, your career and the people you've met. Maybe we can do that another time. But let's talk about what you're doing now. You have a uh, passionate interest in photography, as I understand it. Interest? Passion? Uh, 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 yeah, it's my hobby. Uh, it's your hobby. Yes. Uh, but you also, you were a runner. I remember that. You used to make comments about it, and I know you yeah. participated still, still in many do. of, and you're still a runner. Yeah. In fact, you had to give it up no. today because... Uh, no, actually, you know what? You, you got we it spoke. I said, could we take yeah, this later? Yeah, and you yeah. said, well, we can't. Yeah. So I got up uh, I got up early. early. I got up early. Thank and you. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I run um, and walk now. Uh, I used to run. Uh -huh. Seriously. But now I run I, I walk. I walk yeah. on the treadmill. Yeah. Boring. Yes. Uh, in the time we have, though, let's talk about your photography and about your wife, who is an artist. Yes, Susan. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. yes. Uh, we're going to be... Scary little picture. Uh, scary little... Scary little picture. Uh, I photograph her work. That's one of my hobbies. But that is these an are, original... Oh, these, what these are, now, yeah, these yeah. are photographs and inkjet prints ah. of her paintings. Uh -huh. So all her work I have photographed. And is and she... What medium does she use? Is that she, pastel? Oil. Oil? She paints on oil. oil. Uh -huh. And... Uh, does she exhibit? And does she show? She does. She shows. Uh, Ruth Morpeth has a gallery in uh, right outside of Princeton, New Jersey, Hopewell, New mm -hmm. Jersey, and she is in that gallery. Mm -hmm. And she's been in galleries in the city of <coughs> Philadelphia from time to time. And she sells her work. People do buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, I make prints that she gives away. She won't sell prints. Mm -hmm. It's a, an article of faith. Uh, that's, there's no signature on that, is there? Or some is, might is be. It, if you yeah, look, I can't, uh, some are signed. In my some old are age, I can't find the signature. Uh, some are, some aren't. Yeah, here's one. You see Howard down in the corner. Yeah. There? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also brought a, a black and white photo. Black and white photography has been my hobby for years. I used to have a dark room. Uh -huh. And I made a picture, oh, 10, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, of Susie's grandmother, Irene mm -hmm. Miller. Uh, who, who died about 10 years ago. And what's interesting about this photo is that it was shot on negative film, yeah. black and white negative, mm -hmm. and I developed it and mm -hmm. made a print. This print, however, I scanned the negative, and this is an inkjet print. It's marvelous. And the, the, the it's, technology the is... The quality nice. is marvelous, yeah. and the real irony is that an inkjet print made on a good machine mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. will last as long as the old photographs or even longer. Is that right? Unbelievable. Yeah. And color, the color fades. You know, you buy the, yeah. get the pictures made in the yeah. store and then you see they start to fade. 
Inkjets don't fade. Huh. So it's an interesting thing. It's become much more science. So between running and photography and your wife's artwork and sharing mm -hmm. that uh, love of art with her, what else do you do when you get up in the morning and before you fall asleep at night? Well, I, the, my first couple of hours in the morning are a cup Reading. or two of coffee and, and yeah. four newspapers. And that, that kills a, an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah. I wish we had more time, and hopefully perhaps we can visit again. But uh, we've run out of 30 minutes, so my thanks again for Thank sharing you, the time with me. Pleasure. Until next time, this is 30 Minutes. I am Rick Anthony. Take good care of yourselves.